morning and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in on a, on a Saturday morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Poa from the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Singapore General Hospital. I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon from the sports service. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming for, for, for today's uh, webinar on common and shoulder elbow problems in the active adult. Uh, apart from myself, I have uh, I have uh, my colleague here, uh, Dr. Deborah Huang, uh, who's also a consultant orthopedic surgeon with our sports service at Singapore General Hospital. We have uh, Dr. Victor Tan, who is an associate consultant, uh, sports medicine physician. He's a specialist in sports and exercise medicine. And I have also from a very senior physiotherapist, uh, Ms. Linfen Ru Josephine. And uh, we, we, we're going to cover some of the common uh, issues uh, related to shoulder and elbow problems mm -hmm. in active adult. And we're going to give some advice uh, with regards to exercise and how to remain active. Okay, so with, without a uh, uh, the couple of things, ground rules that we're going to have. Uh, so you can, you can ask questions uh, through our, our Q&A uh, and our speakers will, 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 will try our best to answer them as many questions as possible. Mm -hmm. Some of the questions we will answer directly into the chat uh, as the as the meet as the seminar is going on. And some of the questions we will answer live uh, towards the end, uh, depending on how much time we have left. Uh, so feel, feel, feel free to ask questions as, as we go along and, uh, and we'll hope to keep it as interactive as possible. Okay, if I'm, I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna start off by, by talking about common elbow problems and what to look out for. Okay, let me just switch my screen on. Okay. Okay, and what the and the elbow is uh, elbow is a elbow is a unique part of the body because it's a it's a very sensitive joint and for and and, and a lot of elbow problems uh, can happen both in the both in the, the younger active population and in the and in the older group. Um, so just just a bit about myself. I'm a I'm a uh, orthopedic surgeon at Singapore General Hospital. I've had I've had additional training in uh, in shoulder and elbow surgery, uh, and uh, in uh, in uh, in the management of the of of athletes. So that's my that's my area of interest. And uh, we're going to talk about the common elbow complaints, uh, which occur for in uh, in our in, in in that I see in the clinic essentially. So um, what, what are common problems that people complain of? Uh, pain in the elbow, uh, elbow stiffness. There are some patients who have an uh, unstable elbow. The elbow feels loose. And usually this is after injury. Uh, you can get clicking sounds in the elbow. And, I, and I'm sure some of us have had that before, especially if you're like trying to do push-ups or you're, you're trying to do a bench press and you feel there's this clicking sounds coming up from your elbow. Numbness and pins and needles down the hand uh, originating from an elbow problem. And you can get lumps and bumps around the elbow. The, uh, the elbow joint is, the elbow joint is uh, as a muscle, there's tendon, there's bone, there's cartilage, uh, and there's ligaments and there's nerves. And all, all, all of these things uh, can get injured or they, they can break down over time. And, and and can result in the various complaints that uh, that, that 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 we encounter. Okay, uh, commonly for elbow pain, um, and the the most common condition that that I see in the clinic uh, is uh, is related to the tendon, in particular to the tendon on the outer side of the elbow, um, and uh, that that area is uh, is connected to the wrist and the fingers, and that is that is what we we commonly call a tennis elbow. Some patients uh, have pain on the inner side of the elbow and uh, that's, that's also related to a tendon and that's uh, related to golfer's elbow. I do have patients uh, uh, who, uh, who who work out and they, and they rupture the biceps tendon that's uh, at, the, at the elbow as well. Uh, and for, for patients who have pain at the back of the elbow, they can have problems with the triceps. The, the other the other area of pain on the inner side of the elbow can be from uh, from the nerve, uh, can be from irritation of the ulnar nerve, uh, and that can also result in pins and needles running down the running down the finger, in particular the little finger and the ring finger. 
Um, and uh, for, for patients who do a lot of uh, throwing spots or uh, overhead spots, um, you, you, can, you can injure the ligament, in particular, the inner side of the elbow, the ulnar collateral ligament. So uh the common common commonly when we when we are talking about about the uh, tennis elbow in particular uh is uh, we 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 have uh, we have various options available uh, for in terms of treatment uh first uh with first is uh, stretching and usually this will be guided by the by our therapists our physiotherapist colleagues uh, who will who will, who will help you uh, to to get the right exercises to manage the pain? And uh, I would say eighty percent of the patients that I see uh, get get better with uh, with physiotherapy alone. Uh, some patients, re, re, uh, I'm, and I would advise them that if necessary, they will get a brace, uh, like as what is shown below, uh, that uh, when they when they're carrying heavy things or when they're working out. And I do have patients who. Who, who, who come to me uh, seeing whether there's anything else that can be done. Uh, so short of surgery, there are other options that are available. Uh, this includes uh, injections. Uh, most commonly, would you, uh, pa patients may have received a, a corticosteroid injection uh, prior to coming to, to see me. Uh, but the other thing that we can offer in, in, our, in our department is uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma. Uh, that's another type of uh, injection where there's where we are taking your blood uh, and it's just a small amount of blood uh, as if you're going for a blood test and then we pass it through a centrifuge to remove the red blood cells so you're left with this yellow plasma uh, this this is the this is what helps uh, with uh, healing and we inject this back into the back into the affected tendon um, and that is a procedure which is done, we can do in the clinic. Uh, so it's not something that requires you to take you to the operating theater or, 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 or requires a general anesthesia. So it's a, it's a relatively safe procedure, which we can repeat as many times as necessary uh, because we're using your own blood. Uh, therefore, the, the risk-wise is, is, is a lot less than if we were to be injecting medication. Um, in terms of nerve-related issues, um, if, they, if we suspect that there's a nerve problem, uh, if, if you come and see me in a clinic, uh, I, would, I would assess your movement of your fingers and your sensation and strength in the hand. And most, mo most likely, I would recommend that, that you get a, well, a nerve study, a nerve conduction test. Uh, this, is, this, is done by, this is done in our, our Department of Neurology. And uh, with the nerve conduction study, we, as you can see here, it's, uh, it's, uh, it will test the speed of the nerve running across the, across the joint. And we can see whether the nerve is being pressed on and how, how badly it is affected. Uh, in terms of ligament, uh, my assessment for ligament, uh, I will be checking for, for stability of the elbow. I will also be asking you if you've had uh, injured yourself before, in particular, whether you've dislocated your elbow before, because uh, common common problem is uh, uh, after a dislocation, most people are fine, but there'll be some patients where the elbow still remains unstable, and that could be because the ligament uh, did not heal completely. In terms of test-wise, uh, I, I may need x-rays of your elbow, but not everyone needs an x-ray. Uh, sometimes I may require an ultrasound or an, an MRI. Uh, if if it's going, if I'm going for an MRI for the elbow, I I would I would in in certain situations, if I'm worried about a ligament tear or something stuck in the joint, uh, I would ask for an MRI with an injection. That's called an MR arthrogram. Sometimes if it's a if there's a bit of bone that is uh, blocking your movement or I'm worried about a loose piece of bone stuck in your elbow, uh, then I will need a CT scan. Especially if, I, especially if you've had prior injury before with a previous fracture and we're worried that the bone is impeding on your movement. Elbow stiffness is very common after injury uh, and, uh, and there, are, there are many causes for this stiffness. Uh, to break it down, 
uh, you can have elbow stiffness if the bone, uh, if the bone and joint is is affected, like in uh, osteoarthritis, very similar to the knee and the hip, uh, where the bone is uh, affecting your movement. In other words, you got bone spurs that are preventing you from bending or straightening your elbow completely. Uh, the other area that is more common or in our context uh, is uh, is from uh, soft tissue contractures uh, from uh, after after you've been if they've injured your elbow, let's say you've had a fracture or dislocation, you've been in a cast for a while, uh, you now have stiffness because the the because the the tissue around your joint has tightened up. Most of the time, uh, these these settle. Uh, and with uh, with a bit of stretching uh, guided by guided by our physiotherapist, you'll be fine. Uh, but there'll be some patients who have, are permanently a bit stiff, and these are patients who will come to see me to see what else can be done. Um, some patients, the uh, the older ones with a rheumatoid arthritis, may also come with a stiff elbow. Rheumatoid arthritis as feng feng shi bing, uh, or feng sip is. Uh, is uh is also a, a common condition which which affects a number of patients that we see, and uh, these uh these these patients tend to be already receiving treatment uh, from the rheumatologist, uh, including taking medication. But sometimes even with medication, they still have elbow stiffness. Then we'll be taking a look at them. Uh, th this is an X-ray of a patient with uh, osteoarthritis of the elbow. So. Uh, uh, he's had uh, prior prior injuries, uh, sports related injuries when he was younger, and now his elbow is stiff. And you can see there's all these extra bits of bone, uh, which are in in impeding his movement. Uh, and his joint is a bit narrow because he's lost some cartilage. The the this is the scan, the scan CT scan uh, showing the showing the bone spurs that are sticking out. Uh, in in the joint, uh, and that's why it's impeding his movement. So you can see over here, uh, and and because it's bone that is blocking his his his, his movement, uh, then we may want to consider removing these bone spurs. Okay. You can get an unstable elbow uh, after a dislocation. Um, as I said, most uh, elbow dislocations. Uh, they, after you've been in a cast for a while, uh, you just have a bit of stiffness, which you stretch it, stretch it out, and then you're fine. There'll be some patients where after a dislocation, the ligaments are still loose. Uh, in other words, uh, the elbow still feels unstable when you're doing push-ups, uh, when you're doing bench press, when you're doing dips, when you're pushing yourself up from a chair. Uh, find that the elbow still feels loose, uh, then we will want to assess whether there is a uh, ligament tear which hasn't healed. Elbow clicking is uh, another common common thing that I encounter now and then. Uh, the clicking sounds at, uh, may or may not be painful. The, the ones that the ones that we are more worried about are, are clicking clicking in the elbow, which is painful. There can be a few possible causes for that. Uh, one is there's something loose uh, floating around inside the joint, uh, which is blocking your movement. Okay, uh, so that's uh, commonly it's a piece of bone or a piece of cartilage which may have broken off from a prior injury uh, or from arthritis. The other er the other possible causes uh, for for elbow clicking, you could have a you could have a uh, the ulnar nerve, which is a nerve on the inner side of the elbow, could be slipping in and out of of its groove as you bend, and then you get this uh, clicking sound. Or it could be one of the tendons, in particular the triceps tendon, which could be snapping in and out uh, as you are moving your elbow. Or it could be a piece of tissue that's stuck inside the elbow, and uh, this is this is uh, um, it's known as a plica. This is a remnant piece of tissue. Uh, from from childhood, uh, when when uh, when your elbow joint is 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 being formed uh, in your in as you are developing, uh, it is formed from several different parts that join together, uh, and the intervening wall then breaks down. Mm -hmm. So the si si similar to when when you when when you when you just gotten your flat. And you want to tear down one wall in order to make one, in order to make two small rooms into one bigger room. And a contractor may tell you that the 
the part partition at the side will, will have to be left behind. There'll be a little strip that will have to be left behind uh, in between the two rooms. Likewise, uh, that can happen here. And you have this thing which is called a fly car. So it's an extra piece of tissue in the joint. And for some people, uh, the fly car is bigger than others and it can get blocked, stuck or inflamed uh, in the elbow, uh, resulting in clicking. For so if you've got a extra 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 piece of bone or cartilage that's blocking your movement, uh, we can remove it. Uh, this is uh, this is a video showing showing surgery in the elbow, uh, and this is a uh, this is arthroscope arthroscopy or keyhole surgery. And here you can see that I'm removing this loose piece of uh, of bone which is inside the joint uh, blocking movement. So this is removal of a loose body. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, the nerve, the co common nerve that is irritated around the elbow is the ulna nerve. It's the nerve on the inner side. It's the one that can snap or click. It's also the one that can cause numbness in your in your pins and needles in your little and uh, ring finger. Uh, there's also a there's also another nerve that runs uh, on the outer side of the elbow into the muscle. And for some people, that nerve uh, can get stuck as well in the muscle. That's the posterior interosseous nerve. In terms of lumps and bumps uh, around the elbow, uh, the most common lump that I encounter is at the tip of the, the tip of the elbow. That's uh, that that is uh, that is like filled with fluid. Uh, that's called the olecranon bursa. Uh, most of the patients who come and see me with this, uh, they they have this unsightly lump uh, that is sticking out. Uh, and they, they, if they, if you feel it, it's with watery on the inside. So it's usually filled with uh, fluid. Uh, and as you can see here in the photo over here, uh, the skin itself tends to be okay. Uh, and the options I have for, for, for olecranon bursa is uh, we can leave it alone since it's harmless. Uh, to stick a needle into it to try and draw the fluid out, which is called an aspiration. Uh, sometimes uh, these things recur after that, but I can always repeat the aspiration since it's a relatively safe procedure. And for some patients, uh, because it keeps coming back or oh, it's very big, uh, they may ask me to have it removed. If I want to remove it, then it's surgery. For patients who have gout, uh, they can get uh, they can get lumps with the gouty deposits uh, at the elbow uh, similar to what you get around the ankle with gout and those are called gouty tophi and for patients who have a high cholesterol a very high cholesterol sometimes the cholesterol deposits can get stuck around the tendon and then you get this thickening near the triceps which is called tendon xanthoma so in 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 uh, I, in, in this particular patient here who had an olecranon bursa. Uh, it was really, very big, as you can see. Uh, so we, we just, he decided he wanted it removed. Uh, and uh, if I were to remove this uh, by, by cutting it away the open, uh, there, there will be a big scar. And uh, uh, this, uh, if this patient wasn't too keen on having a, a long scar. And of course, we were also worried about wound breakdown. So we decided to remove this uh, keyhole. Uh, from the inside. As you can see over here, the, it's removing the, the tissue from the inside so that it's, we clean it up. So the, the, the end result is the end result is that he, he the, the, the lump did not, did not come back uh, and uh, he, has, uh, he has minimal scarring. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to end here. And uh, if you've got any questions along the way, uh, feel, feel, feel free to key it in to the, to the Q&A board uh, and, and then we will answer it as we go along. Okay, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're gonna move along to, to our next speaker. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Deborah Huang. Uh, she's, a, she's a consultant orthopedic surgeon, the same department as me with the sports service at a Singapore General Hospital. Uh, and, uh, and being in the sports service, we, we, we specialize in, in uh, management of uh, sports injuries, minimally invasive surgery. And, uh, and she has additional training in uh, shoulder and elbow surgery as well. So she, she's, she's gonna talk about, uh, about, about 
what are the common conditions uh, which result in shoulder pain? Over to you, Deborah. Okay, hang on one second, yeah, I think. And... All right, can everybody see my slides? Yes. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege for us to have your precious time on this Saturday morning to join us for this shoulder and elbow session. Uh, our hope is that, you know, you um, are able to learn a little bit about what makes up your shoulder joint, what are the common causes that uh, of pain in the shoulder, and whether or not you need to seek uh, a specialist opinion. So starting with the anatomy of the shoulder, the shoulder is made up of bones, as with all uh, other parts of the body. And these bones form two specific joints and they are held together by soft tissue, both ligaments and a special tissue called the labrum, which we'll elaborate about further. And on the outer layer, there's the muscles that, arise, that give rise to the rotator cuff tendons uh, that attach into the shoulder and it's the main, one of the most important movers of the shoulder. So the three main bones in the shoulder would be the clavicle, which is also known as the collarbone. It's a prominent bone, you can feel it over on your own shoulder. The humerus is the second bone, which is the upper arm bone. It gives rise to the ball part of this ball and socket joint. And the scapula. Uh, the scapula has a part called the glenoid, which gives rise to the socket. And also another important part of this odd-shaped scapular bone is the acromion. The two main joints in our shoulder, when people say shoulder joint, actually they refer to this glenohumeral joint. As you can see, the ball, which is the humeral head, and the socket, which is made up of the glenoid. This glenohumeral joint is the main ball and socket joint of the shoulder and it allows the arm to rotate, to move in, out, up and down, okay? The second joint is the AC joint. It is a very prominent joint which you might even be able to feel on most of your shoulders. It's the joint between the collarbone on the right as well as the acromion part of the scapula. It provides lifting ability for the shoulder. And cartilage. Cartilage is highlighted in blue. It covers the ball, which is the humeral head, and the socket. It hopes to decrease friction in this joint and enable smooth motion of the joint. All joints in the body uh, are covered in cartilage. And that's why your joints move usually freely. There's no problem with it. The labrum is a special soft tissue that I said I would mention because young patients especially are very prone to, are more prone to uh, labral injuries, which we'll talk about in later slides. This soft tissue lines the glenoid cavity. It helps to deepen this very shallow socket for this ball and socket joint. You can think of it like a rubber lining of a container, giving it a seal effect, providing increased increased stability in the shoulder joint. On top of the labrum, uh, we also have the joint capsule, which encircles the joint. It provides this watertight pocket. And together with the three important ligaments in the shoulder, the capsule and these ligaments enclose the shoulder joint, the ball and socket, to give it enhanced stability. Now we come to the muscles. There are four important rotator cuff muscles, as you can see in the diagram on the right. It's an important mover of the shoulder. And these tendons, circled in white, in white, circled in red, arise from the, tend from the muscles and they attach into the bone to stabilize this upper arm humerus bone to the shoulder socket. And it allows for strength in the shoulder as well as a wide range of motion in the shoulder. Finally, this uh, long head of the biceps tendon 
it's actually a tendon that arises from outside of the, sh of the joint and it runs in over the head of the humerus to insert into the glenoid and the, and the top of the labrum in the shoulder joint. This is a, one of the most common causes of pain in the front of the shoulder, which we will speak about later. So for common shoulder symptoms, usually I'll divide them into whether it's a younger patient, less than 20 up to 40, or whether it is occurring in an older patient, above 40 years old. In the younger patients, what do they usually complain of? They usually have loose or unstable shoulders, possibly not much pain, uh, but with certain activities, they find that their shoulder is always about to pop out. Um, in younger patients also, sometimes after acute injury, they can have a very visible deformity with a, a lot of pain. In the older patient, usually it's complaints of stiffness and pain in the shoulder affecting their sleep at night. It's not uncommon also for the older patients to have weakness in their shoulder. And in both age groups, patients can have pain with particular activities, usually overhead activities. And the causes of these we'll speak about in a while. So in the young and active patient, what are the common conditions? If you're a young patient and you have a loose and unstable shoulder, your shoulder may have dislocated before even. It's quite likely that you have torn the labrum. Usually in the front of the labrum is where uh, the tear is if your shoulder had popped out in the front. Less commonly, you can have a tear at the back of your labrum. If you have pain on doing certain overhead activities, weightlifting, throwing, perhaps you might have a tear in the top part of your labrum. And other causes of pain on certain activities uh, could be just an inflammation of the rotator cuff tendons, which usually resolve with rest and some stretching. Uh, if you recently were involved in an accident or you had a fall onto the shoulder or someone had knocked into you uh, when you were playing some sports and you have acute pain, swelling, you can see a visible deformity. You may even have some bruising. It is likely that you might have a collarbone fracture or a separation of your AC joint. So we'll go through these uh, very common conditions uh, quickly. For shoulder instability in these young patients, they would say that their shoulder is loose, unstable. It usually pops out in the front, though it can pop out in other directions. Um, for the first episode, very commonly a lot of them require a doctor to put the bone back into its socket. And for after the acute injury, some of them may have a lingering uh, you know, sense of instability, especially when their arm is lifted by the side and their head, hand reaching towards the back of their head, as you can see in the picture on the bottom right. And a few Patients who have never seen a doctor or sought any medical attention may have had multiple episodes of instability and dislocation, especially if, it was never, if they were never diagnosed or treated. Uh, when the shoulder pops out in the front, out of its socket, the head pops out of the socket, usually it tears the front and the inferior, which is the bottom part of the labrum. And because of this labral tear that usually doesn't heal on its own, uh, they can have recurrent symptoms and episodes of instability, and most of these young active patients uh, would require surgery. Coming to the top part of the labrum is a slap tear, also known as a superior labrum, aka top of the labrum tear. Patients can have pain on certain overhead movements. Usually, these tears can be caused by repetitive move movements. It can be sports related for throwers, baseball, softball, weightlifters, etc. Or it can be job related. Painters, aircon technicians, every uh, occupation that requires them to use their arms and shoulders and to reach above a lot, uh, they can possibly have a slap tear over time. And lastly, if you don't play sports and you don't have any of these jobs, it may also be age related wear and tear. 
Um, for slab lesions, occasionally you might require surgery if this pain starts to affect your lifestyle. For younger patients who are very active and unable to carry on with their sporting activity, surgery is usually advised. So moving on to the acute deformity after a fall on the shoulder, accident or contact spots, um, when you have sudden pain, swelling, um, it, and it's a collarbone fracture, you can usually see a deformity over your collarbone on the top. It doesn't look the same as the other side. And surgery may be required sometimes if the bone fragments are severely displaced, you, if you're in a lot of pain, or sometimes even if one part of the bone is jutting out through the skin. Surgery is definitely required for this category of patients. So with another fall on the shoulder, another possible problem can be the AC joint separation. As you can see on the right over here, a fall onto the shoulder or any direct impact can cause this separation, which would give rise to pain, swelling, sometimes bruising, and surgery may or may not be required. It all depends on the age of the patient, uh, the occupation, uh, the sporting activities, etc. So now we move on to the older age group, above 40 years old. The common complaints that they have would be stiff and painful. Shoulders, which is usually frozen shoulder. Even before we started this webinar, I think I had answered a lot of questions about frozen shoulder. It's definitely one of the most common causes of a stiff and painful shoulder. Um, and a less common cause of a stiff and painful shoulder would be arthritis, as arthritis usually affects the knee joints and the hip joints a little more than the shoulder joints. So in these older patients also, uh, they can have weakness associated with or without pain. And very commonly, the cause of the weakness is a rotator cuff tendon tear. Other patients may just have a nagging pain with certain movements, usually overhead activities. The cause of it could be impingement, a slap tear, or even a biceps tendon inflammation or possible degenerate tears. Um, and finally, some patients with chronic weakness in their shoulder may start to notice that over time, they have a more and more painful and more and more stiff shoulder. The cause of that would be a rotator cuff arthropathy, which, is, which means that it's a large untreated rotator cuff tear that over a period of time becomes arthritis in the shoulder. So frozen shoulder, stiffness and pain is the main symptom. And this occurs because the joint capsule, which we talked about in the anatomy earlier, becomes thick, it tightens up, and it restricts your shoulder movement in all directions. It is very commonly associated with pain at night. These patients have a lot of difficulty sleeping because of pain. And the symptoms of these of frozen shoulder is usually a gradual onset. But usually there's hope because with uh, daily physiotherapy exercises, you can usually get your range of motion back within a year or so. Very few require surgery just for frozen shoulder. So because I also had some questions earlier about what are the causes of frozen shoulder, actually anybody and anyone can, have, can get frozen shoulder. Sometimes there's no reason for it. Uh, but sometimes we find that there are certain predisposing factors that can cause frozen shoulder, such as if you recently had any chest heart surgery or breast surgery, usually you're told not to move the arm. Or if you had a collarbone fracture or an elbow fracture, you're put in an arm sling. And with a long prolonged immobilization, which means not moving your shoulder joint very much, this is when the joint capsule can start to thicken and tighten. Other associated causes of uh, you know, frozen shoulder can be things like having a history of diabetes mellitus, 
or having a history of thyroid problems, etc. So there are many reasons that you can get frozen shoulder and there can be no reason also why you get frozen shoulder. So moving on to the next topic, we have uh, rotator cuff tendon tears. Patients with rotator cuff tendon tears usually have weakness associated with pain. Um, less commonly, it can be an acute injury when they had a very bad fall and suddenly they can't lift their arm. It can be uh, a gradual onset of weakness chronic, from chronic overuse or just gradual aging. It can affect any of that four tendons that we have spoken about earlier. And if strength is a big problem, the tear is possibly big enough and most would require surgery if they would like to regain their strength. So impingement. Impingement was what we were talking about earlier when you have pain associated with your arm held in a certain position. Usually when you hold your arm higher than this, you'll start to have some pain. And this is because the rotator cuff tendons, as you can see in pink over here, um, attach to the humeral head. Above it, there is also the acromion, right? The other part of the scapular bone. When you raise your arm above a certain level, this is when your rotator cuff tendons start to become trapped under the bony acromion. These tendons are compressed, damaged and inflamed with repetitive overhead motion. And even in the long term, sometimes rotator cuff tendon tears can result. Just like the young patient, an old patient or older patient can have a tear in the top part of their labrum. This is usually occupational related as well as age related wear and tear. Similarly, for the older patient, surgery may be required if this pain affects their lifestyle and a trial of conservative treatment was not helpful. Now we move on to the long head of the biceps. There, the biceps muscle is made up of two heads. We won't talk about the short head because it's not within the shoulder joint, but it's the long head that has this special anatomy where it runs above the humeral head and it inserts into the top of the glenoid, right? Uh, top of that rubber lining that we talked about earlier. Usually when this tendon is inflamed or partially torn or through repetitive motion, you know, undergone wear and tear, it can cause inflammation and usually the pain results in the front of your shoulder joint. From repetitive overhead movements, there's excessive and abnormal forces applied across the tendon. Pulling of the muscle and tendon, compression which is pushing, pinching and shearing forces, rubbing forces of this tendon can cause it to become inflamed. If there is no tear in the tendon, usually an episode of rest, avoiding these aggravating activities can possibly help to reduce the pain. Um, but if it's you know, uh, persistent and it doesn't get better no matter what you do, then perhaps for some of these patients, they may benefit from uh, injections. And if that fails, also probably surgery. So we're talking about arthritis from large untreated rotator cuff tears. Usually there's significant weakness from an untreated rotator cuff tendon tear because it's a large tear, at least two out of four of the tendons are involved. Sometimes it can involve three, four tendons. When these patients do not undergo surgery for their rotator cuff tendon tears, over time, they may start to develop progressive and worsening pain and stiffness in the shoulder. A normal shoulder x-ray is seen on the right side, uh, but when there is a chronic tear of this tendon that's not treated, the head slowly migrates upwards, causing wear and tear of the cartilage lining in the joint and eventually bone erosion, even in the acromial joint above, as well as the glenoid bone. And most might require surgery if they would like to regain better shoulder function. So what are the possible treatments for shoulder pain? Usually for most cases, 
if the patient is not complaining of uh, an unstable shoulder that has been popping in and out many times, we usually trial the conservative approach first when surgery is not immediately indicated. Usually it's rest, at least six weeks of rest. Majority of uh, problems, if they are not uh, alarming, should resolve by then. A cold or warm compress can help. Taking painkillers if the pain is very bad. Considering steroid injections if the above has not helped. Physiotherapy exercises are also one of the mainstays of treatment for shoulder conditions that do not immediately require surgery. Lifestyle modification, if they are maybe a, just a, what you call that, weekend warrior, just doing a certain activity on one day and feeling some pain, maybe they can lay off the activity. And alternative medication, like traditional Chinese medicine. When um, all else fails, Usually surgery is an option. Most of our surgeries can be done keyhole, minimally invasive. Uh, few of our surgeries uh, have to be done open. So in conclusion, when should you see a shoulder specialist? For the young or any aged patient with a acute deformity, a lot of pain, immediate swelling and bruising after a fall, you should come and see us. You might have a fracture. We need to follow up and let you know if uh, what the treatment options are. If you have recurrent shoulder instability, usually in the younger patients, and you had your shoulder pop up more than once, you should come and see us. If you've had an inability to perform certain sporting activities, and this is part of your lifestyle, and you want to keep up with it, please come and see us. We will do further um, examination in the clinic and possibly an MRI scan to look at the structures that we've talked about earlier and the anatomy of the shoulder so that we can um, devise the best treatment plan for you. If there has been shoulder pain that started more than six weeks ago, the pain is not improving, it's getting worse in fact, and it's affecting everything you do on a daily basis, you should come and see us. And finally, if the lifestyle that you want is really affected by the shoulder pain, please, come and see us and do not suffer further in silence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, we will now move on to, to, to Dr. Victor Tan. Uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's gonna talk to us about, uh, about, about exercise and uh, his title of his talk is Move It or Lose It. Over to you, Victor. Yeah, thanks, uh, Prof. Pa. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen now. Yep, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep, okay. So, um, thanks uh, for the presentation uh, to my esteemed uh, uh, colleagues earlier so uh, they have done a great job i'm here to uh, do a slight change in terms of the topic i'll be talking uh, more about um exercise and um yep yeah. let's go just hold on okay so just a little bit about myself uh, my name is victor um, so I'm actually a dual accredited uh, in internal medicine and sports medicine. Um, I do have uh, clinics both in uh, Changi General Hospital as well, uh, where I'm predominantly based, and as well as uh, Singapore General Hospital. I'm a medical officer for the Sea Games uh, contingent, uh, both in uh, 2019 and 2022, and these are the sports I play. And uh, yeah, while I do exercise in some way, I also love to eat in some way, and uh, definitely. Uh, there needs to be moderation in both. So here I go. Uh, these are the topics for today. Uh, first, we would like to talk about uh, how are we faring uh, in terms of exercise activities from the young to the old, and uh, why do we need to move? How much do we really need to move? And uh, why do I really need to keep uh, moving and keep exercising? Um, just hold on.
Okay, so um, are our children exercising uh, you know, these days? So a recent study has been done uh, in 2020 uh, by a Singaporean uh, that showed that uh, our children are getting uh, more sedentary uh, these days, uh, up to about eight hours per day. But in terms of uh, physical activity, uh, where we talk about a moderate or vigorous intensity, uh, our children are only just getting about 30 minutes a day. Uh, they are rarely going out using outdoor facilities, even though uh, there have been recent uh, increase in the number of uh, facilities for kids uh, to play around. Um, only a quarter are participating in uh, CCA or extracurricular sports, and that's a bit of a worrying sign, especially when we are talking about uh, cultivating um, our uh, athletes uh, since young. And if we are getting numbers, uh, they are getting so low, uh, we only have that many number of uh, children who will grow up to become a good elite athlete. And uh, more worrying in this study is actually that almost nearly 100% or 95% of our kids are instead getting more screen times uh, up to about 1.5 hours per day. Um, it probably might have started since young uh, when uh, we give uh, screens uh, to our uh, children to keep them kind of like quiet uh, during meal times. Uh, that's why I do suspect. So uh, moving on to our adolescents, uh, are they exercising? So again, another worrying uh, issue is that none of them have actually achieved the 60 minutes of daily moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity uh, that is uh, recommended, uh, which we'll see later. And more are actually uh, engaging in uh, sedentary activity uh, compared uh, with uh, 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 doing a physical activity, yeah. And uh, our Singaporean adolescents are falling substantially short of meeting our recommendations, uh, which I will show in a while later. And this is getting really worrying because now we are even getting uh, NSFs uh, who are getting quite uh, in some way weak and uh, unable to keep up uh, with all their uh, BMT exercises. And uh, this can be seen uh, even more so uh, in recent times especially with the COVID period. Um, are our adults uh, far faring better? Um, well, they seem to be doing so. Uh, up to about 76.4% seem to have sufficient total physical activity, where uh, total physical activity uh, uh, will be that of uh, hitting at least 150 minutes of moderate uh, intensity exercise. So uh, out of this 76%, uh, 70, uh, there were equal uh, male to females uh, up to three quarters uh, doing so. And uh, one in three are doing exercise regularly during their leisure time. And one in three, again, are uh, reported to uh, doing sufficient uh, muscular uh, strength activity, which is another pillar uh, of uh, exercise on top of aerobic exercise. Uh, not surprisingly, the highest number of uh, adults uh, who are exercising belong to the age group between 18 to 29, which is usually one of the golden years uh, in terms of uh, keeping up with uh, physical fitness. And the lowest, uh, again, unsurprisingly, will be our elderly uh, from 60 to 74 years old. So this is just another chart to show that um, about uh, 75% or three quarters of our um, males and females are actually doing high and moderate physical activity. Um, however, I have a bit of a sus suspicion in terms of uh, these um, results because they are mainly uh, done uh, via questionnaire. It's done over the phone. And uh, I always wonder whether people are actually truthful uh, when answering the questionnaires, even though the results are as such. So uh, there's another study again uh, by uh, um, a polyclinic uh, setting. What happens was uh, 2,867 Singaporeans were surveyed uh, for one year period and 83.3% reported sufficient physical activity. Um, the, those who are not doing physical activity seems to be in the age group above 65 years old with an income of uh, there are about uh, between $2,000 to $4,000. And uh, Malay ethnicity and those who have one chronic physical condition, for example, say hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia or diabetes, seem to be doing more 
physical activity compared to uh, the Chinese and those who do not have any physical conditions uh, that they are seeing doctors for. Uh, for the, about half reported sedentary behavior of more than seven hours per day. And apparently older age group now, it seems that um, uh, is not a risk factor. In fact, uh, being older means uh, they are less likely to be sedentary. And those uh, of primary school education seem to be less sedentary uh, in this case, perhaps related to the work uh, that they are doing. However, uh, those who are single, having higher income, those who are obese or multi-morbidity, unfortunately, uh, have a higher risk of being uh, sedentary. Again, I have my suspicions uh, for these numbers of reporting. Uh, and because this survey was done at a polyclinic, uh, healthy individuals uh, do not tend to turn up to polyclinics for no reason. So I'm just wondering whether we are seeing some skewed data, unfortunately. But uh, that's uh, where our evidence is thus far. Uh, our elderly exercising. Um, what happens is uh, there's another local study uh, of about 400 uh, participants. And it seems like 60% uh, had more than three chronic illnesses and 11% requiring uh, walking aids. Uh, the median pass score was 110. A uh, PAS score uh, is a survey uh, to show the physical activity uh, of our elderly adults. And the score ranges from zero to more than 400. And uh, comparing to other studies uh, around the world, uh, which the average number seems to be about 150 or 160, we are kind of like falling short at 110. And uh, this PAS score has uh, decreased significantly with uh, increasing age, uh, unsurprisingly. However, uh, those who are more physically active tend to be more higher educated, uh, better employment, and they're independent and uh, ambulating or walking without aids and have uh, fewer chronic illnesses. Uh, however, uh, it's a bit worrying to uh, note that about 40% uh, are actually spending more than eight hours daily uh, being sedentary. And uh, surprisingly, it seems that twice are more likely to do so if they are employed. Uh, which um, the authors did not mention why. Uh, these are all local, uh, so they are all pertaining to our Singaporeans. So uh, having shown you this evidence, now we need to uh, see why we need to move it. And uh, yep. So uh, based on this uh, Singapore Physical Activity Guidelines, which was re recently published uh, over the past uh, two to three months uh, in June. So it can be seen that um, exercise actually does reduce uh, cancer activity, uh, does uh, reduce the prevalence of cancer, and uh, including that of uh, uterine cancer, colon cancer, and breast cancer. And the range of uh, reduction will be somewhere between 15 to 25%. Not only so, uh, as our doctors have always, uh, always advised uh, our general population, exercise reduce uh, high blood pressure, stroke, heart diseases in the same range uh, between uh, 15 to 25% as well. Unsurprisingly, uh, with the increasing uh, diabetes prevalence, it is important to keep exercise to reduce uh, diabetes and it can uh, reduce your risk by up to one quarter, as well as osteoporosis, uh, which is the bone loss and uh, leading to subsequent fractures. It, exercise can help reduce uh, osteoporosis by 30%. Next up, um, not only so, uh, it can also help, exercise can also help us uh, in terms of cognitive function, improving brain uh, power, uh, helping uh, to uh, get a more uh, e better emotional health, good self-esteem. Uh, it can reduce uh, anxiety, especially during this COVID period uh, by up to about 40%. Uh, there is increasing evidence uh, and uh, even more so, as I'm attending, uh, as I'm speaking right now, actually in Spain, uh, in a sports science conference, that we are seeing more and more evidence that uh, uh, exercise can actually help depression and even Alzheimer's and dementia by even up to 50%. Um, not only so, exercise in itself can also help to promote uh, social cohesion. Uh, interaction with uh, other uh, human beings, uh, interaction with our friends, and uh, getting uh, 
a sense of belonging when they engage uh, in sports, as well as national pride uh, when our physically active individuals uh, uh, move on to become elite athletes and then later on to win uh, world championships. So uh, the, uh, this is uh, just another slide uh, to show the improvement and the impact on uh, individual and community development. So uh, why should we exercise? Uh, for the kids, uh, what happens is uh, sedentary behavior tends to lead to poorer health outcomes, uh, poor cardiovascular fitness. And um, this will lead to un also unbehavioral, um, unfavorable measurements of behavioral conduct. And uh, this will, um, being sedentary can also lead to increased obesity and poor mental health and uh, increasingly uh, poor uh, poorer uh, uh, mental health in our kids, uh, then they are less resistant uh, to psychological distress as well as being more depressive. So on the flip side, uh, getting our kids uh, to exercise will improve their fitness, improve their mental health, improve their cognitive outcome, getting better grades, getting better fitness, and um, also help to develop their growth and development and bone health. And it's unsurprising that uh, uh, children or kids uh, who exercise more tends to do well uh, in terms of uh, their education and in terms of uh, their overall social cohesiveness. How about evidence for adults? Being sedentary actually uh, uh, leads to poorer sleep, poorer vascular fitness, and unsurprisingly, it will increase our obesity and diabetes outcomes. And uh, it's non-surprising that we have been seeing on the Straits Times that the diabetes prevalence has been growing more and more. And uh, it can also lead to poorer uh, mental health, being more depressive. Again, on the flip side, uh, when we start to exercise, uh, it helps uh, improve and reduce uh, hypertension, uh, get uh, normal and uh, get getting to normal blood pressure, reduce uh, the prevalence of cancer as we have uh, previously seen, and uh, improves uh, our bone health, reduction in the bone uh, uh, risk of getting osteoporosis, and improving our mental health and cognitive function, and uh, allowing us to be more alert at work <clears throat> uh, with better uh, work uh, productivity. So uh, this slide is just to show that in the recent uh, COVID uh, pandemic, um, those who are able to uh, exercise more and who have a better physical activity actually do better and are less likely to get hospitalized or die uh, from COVID. And this is a study uh, that was uh, done uh, in the Western population. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we haven't published our Singapore data, but uh, there seems to be something similar going on as well for our Singaporeans. So moving on. How much do we need to move? And this is where our uh, guidelines uh, now uh, comes about in order to uh, help our uh, Singapore population um, exercise better. So um, in this uh, Singapore Physical Education uh, Physical Activity Guidelines, uh, it's recommended for kids as young as uh, zero to two years old, uh, obviously uh, to be sleeping well, uh, to be sleeping more uh, most of the time uh, to allow for uh, growth. But when they're awake, to uh, encourage uh, floor-based activities for a minimum of 30 minutes a day. For the one to two-year-old kids, uh, it's better to advise them uh, to actually spend at least three hours uh, every day to actually do any form of physical activities to run around and uh, to get some form of outdoor play um, so that they can get the interaction, get their physical activity and uh, to allow for bone growth uh, during their play as well. Likewise, uh, for the three to six years old, the same advice uh, will be given uh, to spend at least three hours of their day uh, in various forms of physical activities and 60 minutes uh, should be performed uh, at moderate to vigorous intensity. Uh, what is moderate and what's vigorous intensity? Moderate intensity uh, essentially means uh, allowing uh, yourself to uh, play to the point whereby uh, you can uh, talk but you're unable to sing. Uh, for vigorous intensity, you are unable to sing or unable to talk when you do your physical activity. 
Next, for the school-going children, uh, it is advised again uh, that we uh, accumulate uh, 60 minutes a day for moderate or vigorous intensity uh, aerobic activity per day. And this can uh, essentially involve uh, running, um, jumping, uh, doing various uh, CCA activities, and this uh, should be suffice uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's uh, best that there may be a variety of uh, vigorous intensity exercise and uh, muscle and bone strengthening exercises. For example, say uh, push-ups, pull-ups, uh, doing uh, some form of uh, lightweight activities. And this uh, will constitute uh, muscle strengthening exercises. And uh, this should be allowed for at least uh, three days uh, in a week. And this has been uh, advocated uh, by our colleagues uh, from KKH, uh, who recently uh, also wrote uh, activities uh, guidelines for the kids uh, this year. And it has been incorporated uh, into this uh, Singapore activity, physical activity guidelines. In terms of sleep, uh, our kids are not sleeping enough and they should be actually sleeping at least about uh, 8 to 10 hours uh, for 14 to 17 years old and 9 to 12 hours for 17 to 30 years old, uh, 13 years old. The reason being that uh, uh, play and uh, studying actually gets better with better sleep and better rest. And um, with regards uh, to what kind of uh, activities, in terms of moderate intensity activities for aerobic exercises, that may include games at the playground, uh, cycling, racket sports, whatever that the kids uh, would prefer to do. Vigorous intensity will be uh, be, uh, being competitive in, in the racket sports, mountain biking, or something uh, more heavy in the aspect. Strengthening exercises could include uh, that of climbing, and high intensity uh, exercise will include that of a uh, circuit training, jumping, hopping, playing in a football game. Yep, and so on and so forth. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, it's best if uh, those physical activities can also involve locomotor skills. Uh, for example, walking, jumping, running hopping, skipping, uh, which are what kids usually like and tend to do, uh, object control uh, to uh, focus, uh, 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 to, to uh, train up their focus uh, in terms of uh, throwing, catching, kicking, as well as stability skills uh, such as balancing, turning, twisting. Ballet could be uh, one form of uh, exercise uh, for the young females or even the males as well if they're interested in ballet. Yeah, so in terms of adults, uh, it has been uh, uh, shown time and again that uh, we need to aim for at least about 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. And uh, this is in uh, line with the World Health Organization recommendations. So 150 uh, uh, to 300 minutes of moderate intensity to vigorous uh, intensity exercise. And uh, it's advised that at least two of these days are spent uh, on uh, strengthening exercises as well. Yep. And uh, another group of uh, uh, patients whom has been lacking for many years, and uh, I'm glad that it actually was brought out in this of Singapore Physical Activity Guidelines, are those of uh, pregnant females. For those who have been exercising regularly uh, before they were pregnant, it is advised for them to continue uh, with their physical activity even through their uh, pregnancy. Uh, of course, uh, um, being um, uh, less vigorous uh, during the uh, third trimester. It has been shown time and again that, uh, and even in this uh, sports uh, science conference that I'm attending uh, currently, that um, pregnancy, uh, exercise during pregnancy actually do have good outcomes uh, for the children uh, later on uh, after, they are, uh, after they are born. So uh, we have to keep our uh, females uh, um, uh, going in terms of exercise, even through their pregnancy. So uh, in terms of how much activity, um, we do advise for about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. And it can be done uh, through their uh, first, second, and third trimester. Um, what happens is, however, uh, when doing exercise activities, uh, we do advise uh, if they have not started any exercise activities before to start walking. Uh, jogging might uh, be a bit too much uh, for the start. However, if they are able, uh, they are more comfortable after walking and have a good uh, fitness later on, jogging shouldn't be an issue. And it's also advised uh, for uh, 
the young uh, female, uh, the females who are pregnant to actually do stretching exercises and to do small amounts of activities gradually. And uh, it's advice uh, for the pregnant females uh, to always be hydrated uh, during this period of time, as well as not to do exercises in which they have to lie head up uh, on the ground. This is because uh, the uterus uh, being big uh, with the um, uh, uh, with the placenta may also uh, compress on the blood vessels uh, that lie behind. So uh, it's advice uh, for the pregnant females to actually keep in an upright posture during exercise. For the elderly, what happens is that uh, the same advice goes and uh, we, there is a big uh, emphasis in terms of engaging in muscular strengthening exercises for at least two or more days uh, in a week. Uh, this is because uh, we do know that elderly actually have uh, increased uh, muscle loss and increased uh, muscle, uh, increased uh, loss of the muscle strength as well. So, um, and because of those, uh, elderly tends to fall uh, more, more so uh, most of the time. So hence, uh, strengthening exercises are now uh, placed at uh, greater emphasis and of equal importance uh, to aerobic uh, physical activity. All these uh, slides can, uh, all these uh, pictures can actually be uh, downloaded from the Singapore Physical Activity Guidelines uh, that's free available online. So lastly, I will just uh, go on to why we need to keep exercising. So uh, as we can see in this slide, what happens is uh, it takes time for us to build our physical activity and uh, our fitness and uh, of, obviously uh, to, it takes time to, uh, to build muscles. And we need a good uh, mental strength uh, to keep uh, uh, persisting to do the exercise activity. The last picture, however, is to show that uh, no matter how much uh, you do, but if you keep uh, a sedentary uh, lifestyle later on after building up, everything can be lost uh, in a very uh, short moment of time. So it's important to actually keep doing uh, what you are doing uh, to keep maintaining uh, the improvement in terms of physical activity, uh, fitness, as well as the muscles uh, uh, that uh, you have at this moment in time. And uh, this picture also highlights that uh, just purely from aging, our physical activity, uh, our fitness actually regress. So uh, looking at uh, um, on the left side, what happens is uh, when we are younger, our fitness uh, actually, uh, uh, it, for when we are younger, our uh, physical activity, uh, our fitness is uh, greater, and it over the uh, over the years it drops every ten percent. And uh, on the right side, in terms of uh, muscular strength, uh, it can be seen that uh, because purely from aging, our bone uh, strength and our mass actually peaks at about 20 to 30 years old, and then you'll start dropping uh, into adulthood and older life. So we need to keep exercising to keep ourselves on the lighter blue band, such that the drop uh, is not as great as uh, what the graphs show. Uh, the other reason is that, uh, as can be seen, our body uh, metabolism will keep carrying on no matter what. So uh, when we are habitually active, uh, our muscles uh, are constantly actively uh, storing glycogen, uh, building up um, glucose. They are always working out and um, they do, do not suffer from uh, muscle atrophy. However, uh, as can be seen on the graph on the right, when we start to become a sedentary, uh, our, uh, we become more insulin resistant because there's increased fat tissues, increased liver triglycerides. And uh, this also results uh, 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 in our muscles becoming smaller in size with less glucose uptake uh, because it's now more resistant uh, to insulin and glucose. So likewise, uh, this other picture shows the same uh, 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 picture uh, in terms of what happens at the cell level. So why do I need to keep uh, exercising? There are many ways of uh, exercising. Uh, we can actually uh, keep up uh, either by increased frequency, uh, by uh, doing a more intense uh, exercise, uh, increasing the time or duration of our exercise and the type, the type of exercise that we do. So uh, this is actually just to show that uh, over time, 
uh, we need, um, because uh, studies have been shown that uh, it takes you at least about six weeks uh, to keep up uh, and improve your physical activity. And uh, on the right side in the bar chart, you can see that the more you do, the better and the more increase in the cardiovascular fitness that you will have. Um, cardiovascular fitness usually takes at least about six weeks to gain. So uh, this is based on various uh, studies out there that ranges uh, from at least uh, between four to eight weeks uh, with a minimum exercise of uh, three times per week. However, when you do not exercise, what happens is that, um, as can be seen by the various papers, um, just a three-week date confinement will make you regress in terms of fitness by one quarter. And um, being inactive for two weeks will cause you to lose your fitness by 0.5% per day. And if you are inactive again uh, in the first three weeks, uh, up to 7% uh, of your cardiovascular fitness will be lost. So if it takes you six weeks uh, to gain that few percentage, it, uh, that same percentage will be lost just in half amount of time. Yeah, so this is uh, quite important uh, for us to keep uh, maintaining our exercise activity. So again, uh, in terms of uh, muscular strength and muscular growth, uh, it usually takes at least about six to 10 weeks uh, for the growth or hypertrophy uh, to start occurring with at least uh, four sessions of resistance uh, training uh, done in a week, three to four. And however, if we stop exercising, uh, stop uh, 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 our resistance uh, training, we can see that there's a one to 4% loss in muscle mass just two weeks after any reduction in exercise. And uh, there's even a 12% reduction uh, in terms of the protein synthesis. During a COVID study, it has also been shown that just 10 days of not doing any exercise activities just from recovering from a COVID exercise will cause a 6% loss in terms of muscle mass and 10% loss after about one month. And uh, more importantly, beyond this uh, loss of mass, we, there's a greater emphasis in the loss of strength. So what happens is that for the same period of time where the muscle mass is lost, there is a greater increase of uh, loss of strength at two to five times faster than the loss of mass. And loss of strength is a more consistent risk factor for disability and death than the loss of muscle. Uh, this last uh, slide is also to show that uh, for every sedentary uh, hour that we have, there will, there will be an increased risk of uh, getting a high blood pressure. And uh, this uh, increase, uh, although 0 .6, uh, 0 0.06 for the systolic blood pressure and 0 0.2 for the diastolic blood pressure, it accumulates over time. And there will be a 2% increased risk of getting a uh, high blood pressure over time the more we do not uh, exercise. So this last slide uh, is my take-home message for everyone. Exercise has now been shown, and hopefully I have shown you, that there are more benefits than risks uh, for getting exercise, uh, to do exercise activities. Uh, the current guideline states that we need at least 150 to 300 minutes per week, and uh, we need to progressively increase. And the last message is that if you don't keep it uh, up, you'll lose it faster than you gain it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Victor, for, for for that for that very in, that very informative talk. I think most of us should be going out to exercise over this weekend uh, after after listening to that. Um, I'm not. Well, I'm not going to move on to 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 rehabilitation um, after injury or surgery. And this presentation is by is is, is by Miss Lim. Uh, she's a senior physiotherapist with the Department of Physiotherapy uh, at Singapore General Hospital. And her and the area that she specializes in is in musculoskeletal and sports physiotherapy. Uh, and her, her, her she has a lot of experience with the with the treatment of uh, of musculoskeletal conditions. And she's currently leading the physiotherapy sports service at SGH. Uh, over to you, Josephine. Now I need to share the screen. Thank you, Ken.
I can someone stop the screen sharing. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Josephine, and I'm a senior physiotherapist from Singapore General Hospital. Uh, I'm specialized in managing sports and musculoskeletal injury, mainly, mainly to help the athletes and general populations to restore optimal functions and also to facilitate uh, their return back to sports and activity safely. So today I'm here to share the rehabilitation journey. So basically uh, answering the questions of what's next after an injury or surgery. So we know that pain in shoulder or even in the elbow can have many causes. Uh, you might injure it during a fall or accident, or you could have overused your arm uh, or when you do many household chores or when playing sports. So what should you do if it happens to be you or if it happens to be someone you know who had an injury? Okay, so if you have injured your shoulder or your arm, these are some of the questions that can guide you on what symptoms you might have. So questions like, do you feel your joint is popping out of the socket? Or can you move your arm normally? Or is your shoulder or elbow too stiff or too painful to move? Uh, is your arm strong enough to do the things that you normally do? Things like carrying a laptop or throw a ball like you normally would. There are definitely signs and symptoms that you need to see your doctor right away. So such as if your arm or your hand is weak or numb, or you really can't feel your hands or you felt a uh, tingling sensation to your fingers, um, or if your shoulder or your arm looks deformed, so basically it does not look the same as the other side, or if your pain is too intense to the point that, you cannot, uh, that it affects all your daily activities, or if you can't move or use your arm at all. So do approach your doctors right away if you experience any of the signs and symptoms. So what should you do after an injury? So go by stages. At the initial stage, it is important to know that this early phase of injury, your body will tend to respond in the process of inflammation where the area involved might be painful, might be swollen, and it might be red or even warm to touch. And during this period, you might want to protect that area while allowing your healing process to take place. So this would mean that you would need to avoid activities and movement that could, uh, that could worsen your pain for the first couple of days. You can even bandage or sling your arm to hold it in place for comfort if necessary. And to reduce pain and swelling, uh, you can apply some ice pack uh, and elevate your arm above your heart level as often as you can throughout the day. And once the pain has settled down, you might want to gently move your arm to preserve your muscle strength and prevent joint stiffness. So rather than a complete rest, it is encouraged for you to move your arm optimally without aggravating the pain, at least to promote some blood flow and to facilitate some tissue repair and healing. And of course, all this should be paced properly and accordingly to how your body responds at this stage. So other than uh, dealing with injured upper limb, it is also important for you to at least maintain your body fitness by gradually resume some of the aerobic exercises with the options to offload the injured area. So example, if you're a basketball player who needs to shoot or if you're a swimmer, uh, you can do alternative aerobic exercises such as uh, working out on the stationary bike to maintain the heart and your lung function so as to improve your overall body fitness and condition. So moving on to the intermediate stage. Uh, at this stage, your pain and your inflammation might have already dampened down and your injured tissues are maturing. Uh, the healing time frames really depends on the types of injury that you might have, uh, as well as other factors such as your age or your current medical history. Um, usually at this stage, uh, you're able to perform most of the daily activities quite well, such as wearing your t-shirt or combing your hair, but you might still lack some um, strength and flexibility to perform more difficult tasks such as doing a burpees or throwing a ball. 
So this is where progressive exercise therapy will come in, looking at muscle strength, muscle endurance, uh, joint control, and even at later stage, power training if needed, depending on your goals. Um, even at this stage, you, uh, you still need to continue to improve at least your cardiovascular fitness uh, by doing things like brisk walking, stretching bike, or even jogging. So again, progression will be gradual and according to how your body responds in preparations to the activities or your goal that you would like to return to. Okay. And moving on to the advanced stage, uh, this stage is mainly for those who like to go into a higher level of sports, uh, such as recreational or competitive badminton or handball, for example. So rehabilitation is more geared towards individual goal. So at this stage, the repaired tissues are usually more mature, while it continues to remodel itself. So this is a stage where you would want to bring in some sports-specific skills uh, that are more relevant to your goal. Uh, so that you can be stronger or even be stronger than how you were like before your injury. So at this stage also, um, the physiotherapist will guide and also educate you on ways to prevent, uh, prevent injury or re-injury at this stage as well. So how about after surgery? How would uh, rehabilitation be different from conservative management? So after surgery, you might be expecting some restrictions uh, after operations just to allow the tissue structures that has been repaired to heal properly. Um, throughout the entire rehabilitation process, the physios will also work closely with your surgeons to make sure that your rehab progression is optimal. So to put all into perspective, so let's take a look at our case example, Mr. S. So Mr. S is a 30-year-old male who had undergone shoulder surgery after an injury while playing basketball. His goal is to be able to move his arm pain-free and to return to recreational basketball. So at the initial stage, immediately after his shoulder surgery, he was advised to rest the shoulder for the first few days or the first three weeks before he can start to move it. It is also advised to be on arm sling to avoid excessive movement of his shoulder to protect his arm from pain or injury. He was also advised to continue ice pack to reduce his pain and swelling at his surgical site. And after some period of rest and allowed by the surgeon, he is ready to move his shoulder. And this is when he will start some gentle ranging exercise such as the pendulum here where he uses his body to move his arm so as to allow the muscles, the shoulder muscles to rest while uh, the joints move. And as a progression, he will use the stick to move, to improve the flexibility and movement at his shoulder. Moving on, uh, at the intermediate stage. Um, usually at this stage, his pain and swelling are now under control and there's not much pain with graded activities. So this is when he will be doing more progressive exercises. Um, example here is him doing strengthening, uh, strengthening his shoulder with the exercise band. So this is one of the exercise to strengthen the rotator calf muscles. And next, Mr. S also need to improve his ability to control his shoulder, uh, to improve his shoulder joint movement control. So one of the exercises you can do is to uh, use the equipment called the body blade. And this is where he has to continuously flat that body blade with his upper arm while he moves his shoulder throughout the plane of movement. So this may look easy, but if you try it, it can be quite hard to do. So Mr. S is now at the advanced stage where his symptoms are minimal. Before progressing on to, his, to this stage, uh, the physiotherapist will usually do some assessment such as strength tests to ensure that he's ready to uh, be at this stage to perform sport-specific drills. He will also attain the doctor's clearance at this point for more loaded exercises. So at this stage, uh, rehab 
will include exercises to improve his speed and reaction time. So example here is him touching the lighted pops as fast as he can while maintaining the plank position. And because he's uh, also a basketball player, he will need to improve his skills on throwing and catching the ball, which requires uh, some strength and power to do so. So one of the exercises uh, he did was overhead throw with medicine ball. So the ball actually has a weight, so he needs to have the strength to carry the ball, to aim and throw the ball at the trampoline and catch the ball again. And so when uh, is Mr. S ready to return to basketball? Or when are you ready to return back to basketball? Um, after going through all the rehabilitation process, Mr. S has gained approval from his surgeon to return to basketball. So he had completed several physical tests by the physiotherapist to ensure that his shoulder is ready to take a more load. And he's also now confident and ready to return to his sports, which is basketball. So at this stage, he would uh, return to training with his coach and his team, uh, meaning that he will be doing more of the basketball drills with his team to play uh, to play half a match and then to, to play full match eventually. And even after he had gone back to play, uh, we would still recommend that he should continue to improve his strength and the conditions of his arms and his entire body so as to prevent any re-injury uh, in the future. So all in all, as we go through rehabilitation process, be it post-operatively or conservatively, the rehabilitation process will be planned out and paced according to each individual's needs and their injury. So rehabilitation um, may not be as straightforward because there are still many other factors that can affect the healing process as well as your rehab progression, such as how hardworking you are uh, when you do, in doing your exercises, uh, your sleep, your diet, or even your current health. So improving your health and your fitness as soon as possible and as early as possible is still the key. And it's never too late to start working out, just like what Dr. Victor has said, if you don't move, you will lose it. All right. So with that, I'll end my presentation. Uh, I would also like to give credit to my assistant, Hari, to demonstrate the exercise in the video for this presentation. All right. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Josephine. Uh, we've we've we we come to the end of the of the presentation component for this session, and we are now going to answer some of the questions uh, which have been brought up by the audience live, uh, as we feel that some of some some of these questions are best uh, are best answered uh, uh, live, um, and so then we can clarify things as we go along. So the first one up is uh, how how long does it take for tennis elbow to recover and what should we do to prevent uh, future injuries? Uh, so in, in, in terms of tennis elbow, um, it depends on what the underlying cause is. Uh, if, if, it's, uh, if it's sports related, uh, then, and, and it's really from tennis, which by the way, only 5% of my patients with tennis elbow play tennis, uh, then it's important to be, to be looking at your posture uh, and your technique. The main, the, the main problem for a lot of us is when we when we play when we play tennis and backhand. Uh, if you will see how a professional player does a backhand versus how most of us do a backhand, most of us are using our wrists and uh, to 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 do the backhand. And and when you use the wrist to the backhand, you're putting a lot of stress on the tendon at the elbow, and uh, that's how that's how you get tennis elbow. Uh, the for 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 the for the rest of my ninety five percent of patients who who have this who don't play tennis, uh, usually it is uh, occupation related. Um, if you're if if you're a mechanic, uh, if you're into childcare, uh, if you're if if you're a beautician, a hairdresser, uh, where you where there's repetitive movement of of the of the elbow. Uh, and for and, and for that there are there are a few things that are that are needed. Uh, one of course is to look at ergonomics, to look at your, the position of all your equipment, position of your computer, the position of your workstation. Uh, also to look at the height of your chair, 
the other thing to look at is um the other, the, other, the other thing to look at is to have regular stretching and um, and regular exercise in order to prevent a re recurrence of pain in re related to this uh, there were a couple of questions asking about colical steroid injections uh, and uh, and and the role of that uh, well steroid injections uh, help with pain relief uh, the pain relief is temporary and you and usually it's just enough so that you can can you can go and visit the, the physiotherapist and start on your rehab. Um, some patients, uh, some patients may opt to go for a PRP, platelet rich plasma injection, uh, in in order to get a longer term pain relief. The underlying cause of uh, of tennis elbow is a uh, is basically repetitive movement. You get a micro tear in the tendon, and uh, this. This is a competition between how much it, how how long it takes for the for healing to your know, body's ability to heal versus the 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 constant use with the re injury and uh, for a small number of patients they may still require surgery in order to stitch up the tendon to prevent pain from coming back in the future. Okay, we'll see what's the next question. Uh, okay, so so we, there have been a couple of questions related to uh, anti-inflammatory foods uh, and uh, and uh, supplements. So um, this this is about RC tendinitis or rotator cuff tendinitis. Uh, the term tendinitis is a misnomer. Um, it's like as similar to tennis elbow. It's mainly due to wear and tear. So the the correct term used medically is tendinosis. Um, it's so there's. In terms of inflammation, if we were to examine the, the, the tendon as what we do during surgery, you find that there's not much inflammation. Basically, the tendon is frayed and is worn out. So in terms of the use of uh, anti-inflammatories, it's mainly for pain relief. Um, in, in terms of uh, supplements of food, if we're looking at F, um, people talk about the use of, of the turmeric or capsicum uh, for pain management. Uh, and uh, there's not much in terms of anti-inflammatory food otherwise uh, that can be that can be used to reduce the pain. Okay, thank you. Hello. Okay, so I see that a 30-year-old is asking about a small rotator cuff tear, less than 1 cm. Will you be covering the indicators for recovery and or surgery? So first, I think we look at a few factors. We look at age, yes. It seems like you are considered a young patient. And if you had a rotator cuff tear um, that is causing symptoms like weakness and pain, and after a short period of physiotherapy exercises being compliant to that, you still feel that your shoulder is just not the same as before. If it's your dominant hand, it probably affects your activity more than usual. I would say that you, know, you should come see us so that we can take a look at your scan, examine you, and let you know if surgery is uh, required. From the sound of it, um, if you leave such small tests, less than 1 cm can be 1 mm, 5 mm. Usually, these are quite insignificant. They usually shouldn't cause much weakness. Uh, but if they're on the higher side of less than 1 cm, like 0 0.99 mm, they can possibly start to show some symptoms of weakness and more pain. And if you're young, usually advise surgery because these tests do not heal on their own. Okay, I think we have another question about rotator cuff tendon tears and whether they're always painful. I think in my slide earlier, I wrote there rotator cuff tendon tear, weak plus minus pain. Yeah, so initially, I think when you have torn a tendon, most of the time you experience some pain. Your body's reaction to such tears would be inflammation, which is uh, trying to create some form of a healing response. Uh, over time, uh, with some rest, some anti-inflammatory medications, the pain may have settled down and um, you might not have a pain from there. Uh, and for patients who have wear and tear of their rotator cuff tendons due to the activity that they do, um, can they have a tear that they don't know about? 
Yeah, that is possible because uh, quite a number of my older patients in the 40 to 50 age group, they would say, oh, they have been having some form of an ache in their shoulder and over time progressively it had gotten worse. Perhaps at the start of that, when they had some injury that they didn't really know about and a mild shoulder ache, it could have been a small rotator cuff tear. It could have been, there are many other causes of pain, but it could have been a tear. And over time with the repetitive uh, activity and aggravating of the, of the tendon, maybe the tear would have gotten bigger and eventually they would have more pain. Uh, can such a tear progress on to arthritis requiring surgery as in what I talked about earlier, the rotator cuff tear arthropathy, I think it will be quite obvious. If you did have such a large, massive tear, you would definitely feel weakness in your shoulder and that would have prompted you to come and see us uh, before you know there's a chance for it to turn into arthritis. Um, from the period of time of having a large rotator cuff tear to it becoming arthritis is usually many years in between. So you would have, you know, had seen you would have consulted a doctor if your shoulder was not feeling right and you had such significant weakness especially if it's on your dominant hand yeah i hope that answers the question anything to add ken oh yeah so so in, so in terms of uh in terms of uh ten, ten, tendon tears we, we 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 do get patients now and then who have been scanned for 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 other reasons and incidentally a tear has been picked up not everyone is painful or symptomatic or weak from the from the tear, and uh, over oh, there are basically two types of patients who who who, who have a rotator cuff tear. It's a patient who's fallen down, um, dislocated the shoulder, um, and as a result has has ruptured the tendon. Uh, these are the sort of patients where we may be more interested in getting the tendon fixed. In other words, with with surgery. Um, Versus we have the, the other type of patient, which is a which is a patient that has this a progressive wear and tear. Basically, how I explain it is that uh, th th these tears are, are like getting wrinkles, only that it's in your tendon. Mm -hmm. So over time, we, we over time we just accumulate more of them, uh, and uh, a, a lot of these small tears do progress on to big tears. That's another thing that that patients always ask me. But do they necessarily cause trouble? The answer is no. Uh, and 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 I think if as long as you've got if you you've got you got decent motion in your arm, uh, shoulder is not painful and there's there, there there's no weakness and you can manage a lot a, a lot of these tests can be left alone. All right, great. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, this this questions for Victor to answer. Yeah. Yep. So um basically for stairs climbing, um it it can be a bit difficult for patients uh who have some form of knee pain. Um that being said, uh stair climbing in some of the studies, small studies that has been done in Singapore has been shown to be kind of like a good exercise, provided um that uh, you don't get into uh, this sort of uh, knee pain issues. Uh, even if you have knee pain issues, you can come to see us, uh, sports medicine wise or um, uh, orthopedic uh, surgery wise. Uh, we can get you treated well so that uh, we can get you uh, to uh, continue to move. Yeah. So stair climbing is uh, something that uh, I am interested in getting by, but it's just a bit difficult to get the studies going uh, for various reasons. But yeah, uh, it can be a good start if, um, if the pain is not so bad or if no pain at all, yep. Yeah, this is a very good question. It's a very common question uh, in the sports medicine uh, center. So what happens is that uh, depending on the reason why you are wearing the knee guard, um, most of the time, it is a bit of a placebo effect, unfortunately, meaning that there is uh, no... Um, studies that say that wearing a knee guard is actually helpful or prevents uh, knee injuries in any way. So the general advice would usually still be that of uh, strengthening uh, both the hips, the knees, and as well as the uh, quadriceps muscles to help uh, um, um, uh, tolerate the activity, as well as possibly uh, learning good uh, techniques 
during badminton and pick up, uh, pickleball so that you, you, you are doing preventive stuff to even avoid the knee pain in the first place. Yep. So the short answer to that is that um, no, there's no uh, evidence to say that wearing knee guard helps at this moment in time. So we move on to the next question. Yep. Yeah, I've got a question here. How to protect and strengthen the various shoulder parts? Okay, so how to prevent re-injuries really to, you need to be consistent with doing uh, some strengthening exercises to really improve the strength of your shoulders and your arm uh, so that they will be able to meet the daily demands uh, uh, such as like your, your, your everyday household chores. Um, so actually, uh, some of the questions, uh, some of the exercises that you can do is things like using an exercise band, where you can just put into your bag and bring to your office. Just do movements like this, uh, if you can see, like this, to at least uh, strengthen some of the radiator calf muscles. And even with the biceps, because sometimes you need to carry your bag or uh, groceries, you can just uh, use your bag or uh, some dumbbells or even the exercise band to just do some bicep curls as well. So these are some of the common exercises that you can do to help to protect and strengthen uh, your shoulders and your elbows. Um, of course, you don't just do uh, once per week or just once in a lifetime occasionally. Exercise needs to be consistent and it should be progressive uh, so as so that you can it can help to protect your your joints and also to uh, prevent any re-injury you if you have previously injured your joints before. Okay, so I hope that answers your questions. Moving on to the next question. Oh, oh okay. So uh, uh yeah, so can uh can, can ligament heal itself? Okay, so, so this is related to another question which uh, popped up uh, in the Q&A. So where uh, the tendon is, tendon is a piece of tissue that connects the muscle to bone. Ligament is a tissue which connects bone to bone. Uh, in, in other words, it, it crosses it crosses a joint. Um, and the ligaments are involved, uh, are involved in uh, stability of a, of a joint. Where the common ligaments that we tear, um, the ACL in the knee, anterior cruciate ligament, uh, the ATFL, which is uh, the ligament at the ankle, which you tear with an ankle sprain. Um, and you do realize that we get a lot of patients who, who, who have uh, ligament tears, but we, we, we don't send everybody for surgery because it really depends on which ligament is torn. Like for example, in the in the ankle, the ligament that's torn is on the side of the joint. It's not inside the joint, so it's the ability to heal itself. Uh, versus like the ACL, which is a tear inside the knee, uh, it does not heal itself very well. Therefore, therefore, patients who tear the ACL uh, tend to come for surgery uh, because the, the 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 knee remains unstable. Likewise for the for the elbow and the shoulder. Uh, in the in, in the elbow, after elbow dislocation, you can have uh, you can you can tear your you can tear your ligaments. And if you were to do an MRI, it will show that there's a lot of ligament tears. But uh, because most of these ligaments are on the outer side of the joint, uh, they 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 they'll heal on their own. And only a small, small group of uh, of patients uh, who have a persistent instability will therefore need uh, need a repair. Whilst in the shoulder, uh, if you've had a shoulder dislocation, you can tear the ligament that that stabilizes the shoulder, uh, and you find that you have recurrent dislocation of the shoulder, or the shoulder always feels like it wants to pop out. And uh, these are the patients who may require surgery in order to repair it. I hope that answers your question. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so it's a you know related question to to anti-inflammatory diet. So does taking supplements help in bone health? Uh, so uh, so for bone and joint health, what is commonly marketed is glucosamine plus or minus uh, chondroitin. Uh, other supplements is collagen, 
of, of which the on 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 the which you may have encountered in the market. Uh, these are the common uh, supplements uh, for 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 joint for joint health. Uh, do they work? Uh, yes, in some patients they do. Um, most of the time, uh, I have patients who who ask me whether uh, to to taking these supplements. Uh, uh, does is it is it is it is it going to be a problem in in the long term? Uh, the answer is probably no. Um, if you've taken the supplement for about three months or so and the pain is still there, uh, uh, then probably it's not so useful. Um, in terms of bone health, bone health, we we normally talk about calcium and vitamin D, and I, and I think calcium vitamin D supplementation is useful. Uh, especially as you get a bit older, and in particular if you're female, uh, because of the concern about osteoporosis. Yep, okay, we'll move on. Yep, hi, okay. So um, the question is whether it's true that there's a greater tendency of tendon tearing for those having type 1 diabetes, even though it's under control. So unfortunately, the longitudinal studies, meaning uh, time um, studies that go uh, through 10 years, 20 years, does show that there is a slight tendency for those with type 1 diabetes to have a bit uh, of uh, increased risk of tendon tearing, even though it's under control, because the diabetes is always in there. It's always uh, in your body's constitution. So unfortunately, the risk factor uh, stays with you lifelong. But however, whether you will get a tear will be a different issue. Yeah. So uh, what happens is that uh, if you do keep yourself active in a, in a way and uh, you do learn uh, techniques of the exercise that's appropriate, you will reduce greatly the chance of this happening. So that is my uh, two-point answer uh, for this question. Yeah, so uh, with uh, this question goes to as uh, the guidelines being uh, 220 minus, I assume the age of this uh, uh, person who typed the question is 62 years old. Um, so uh, what this person is trying to say is that the maximum heart rate seems to be 158 for him. And if he goes higher than this, is it still okay? So what happens is that uh, 220 minus H is a, gu uh, is a cut off, uh, uh, sorry, um, it's a guide at the end of the day. What it means is that at this heart rate level, you are doing at somewhat maximal level intensity of exercise. So what happens is that um, when you are doing maximal exercise activity, you need to know that you are, of course, at a certain risk of getting tiredness and also um, whether you are able to sustain this activity for a long time. Um, so if you are able to uh, sustain this activity for whatever reason uh, or for whatever that you are doing, um, do just take note, uh, do not uh, stay at this level for too long a period of time um, because you are, at, uh, you are running the risk of uh, potentially uh, getting into uh, shortness of breath issues and such unless you have been training out, uh, tra um, you have been doing training for a prolonged period of time and able to sustain this uh, for a prolonged period of time. Yeah. So uh, there's, uh, if you are just starting out, it's not a good idea for you to hit that level. But if you have been regularly training for uh, some time already, it is okay depending on what you are doing. I've got a question here. Can you advise on weight-bearing exercise for boomers? And what are the pointers to take note to on avoiding joints, shoulders, and knee injuries? Um, okay, I guess for weight-bearing exercises for boomers, you can always start the very simple ones. If it's for the knee, you can actually start off with just like a simple sit-to-stand exercises, where you just sit and then stand up from your sofa and then sit down again repetitively. Uh, as tolerated or up to maybe about 10 to 15 times first, if you haven't done it before. Um, the pointers to take note when you are doing your shoulders or your knee exercises, 
is that you should not be feeling pain or you should not be feeling your pain worsening during the exercises. The pain that I mean is it should not be, the pain should not be coming from your joints, but rather you should still feel some aches and soreness around your muscles because you're actually working out your muscles when you exercise. So if you feel your muscles are working out and you feel that it's very tired around your muscles, then that's correct. Achievement done. Um, but if you actually feel sore around the joints during your exercises, um, probably you need to uh, re-look back at whether you have done the exercises correctly or not. So after exercise, normally you will feel sore uh, for about one or two, two days, but the soreness should not be uh, should not be affecting your daily activities such as your walking or uh, carrying your handbag. All right. So these are the main pointers to take note when you are exercising. So if you have any questions regarding exercises to improve your your joints conditions, uh, you can always feel free to approach uh, the physiotherapist to help you with your exercises. All right. I hope I answer your questions. Thank you. Ah, okay. So uh, it's also another ex ex exercise-related question. So um, I think the most common thing that that I that I that I've seen over the over the past two years uh, uh, is is that uh, they, we I've, I've been getting more more patients with with, with shoulder and elbow pain uh, as a result of our uh, as a result of the COVID nineteen pandemic. We have a lot of patients yeah. who are who are who are, who are stuck at home uh, I they, they have to work from home and working from home uh, has uh, has uh, has a number of hazards I mean apart from the fact that the, there's a tendency to snack and eat a lot more uh, the the other problem with with uh, with working from home is that most of us are working off our laptop um, whilst if we were in the office we'll be working off our desktop and we will be a lot more active we'll be walking up and down um the the not all of us have the have the luxury of having a desk in which to do our work and to place our laptop on i have a fair number of patients who are working on the sofa or the laptop is on a bed or a coffee table uh and uh as a result of that uh being being hunched over the computer uh type, 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 typing for long hours they they tend to get pain in the neck the shoulders and the elbow uh, it's important uh, to always watch your posture, uh, and uh, and um, your mother has always been right to tell you that uh, you need to watch your posture because a lot of the problems that we have uh, with uh, with the shoulder and elbow and the neck ties down to posture. Uh, in terms of uh, stretching, uh, don't remain in one place for for the whole day. Remember to get up and stretch um, in 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 order to maintain your your joint mobility. In terms of exercise, uh, I, 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 Victor has covered the, the 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 main components of exercise and how and and what you need. And Josephine has also gone into the details for that. Okay, uh, over to the next question. Hi. So uh, I think this is uh, getting to be a bit uh, more and more common. Um. We do not really quite advise uh, patients to actually come to the hospitals just for muscle health screening. Instead, po a potential uh, resource that's out there in the community would be that of uh, what we call active health labs. Uh, you can uh, actually uh, go online uh, to search for them. It's a government-funded uh, lab uh, that's uh, promoted by both HPB as well as uh, Sport SG. So uh, when you go to the active health labs, uh, I think uh, it potentially is a subsidized uh, health screening as well. You won't be forking out uh, a huge bill. They can uh, do uh, some sort of a screening for uh, fat mass, fat-free masses and uh, muscles and some form of measurements. Um, so yeah, uh, please, please uh, go to the active health labs uh, to get your health uh, screening for muscle health. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, we've uh, 
we're, we're, we're coming towards the we're coming towards the end of the end of this session. I I, I wish to, I wish to thank uh, everyone for 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 spending the Saturday morning with us, especially for the for the panelists here, uh, for the participants in who are who are who are at home or or at work who are tuning in, and also want to thank uh, the uh, uh, thank uh, Samuel and team from the patient liaison service uh, at the uh, Singapore General Hospital for helping to organize this webinar. And, and I hope and I hope you found the advice you, you useful. Uh, have a have a great weekend ahead. Thank you everyone.